let's talk about digital identity, the podcast connecting identity and business. I am your host, Oscar Santolayo. You might have heard of EIDAS before, especially if you are in the payment industry. But now in the recent years, the European Commission is working on a new version, EIDAS 2.0. We are going to talk about that, and especially from the perspective of Finland, we have a special guest who has been working in, in Finland. Our special guest today is Bo Harald. He started his career in banking in the 1970s by promoting and building electronic banking, payments, and e-business services. He developed Nordea's electronic banking and payments operations for 30 years, after which he started working with Tieto Every as the head of executive advisors. He has also served as the chairman of the EU expert group on electronic invoicing, the chairman of MOBI, Mobile Financial Services Forum, and has held and holds directorships in various companies and associations. He has been named as one of the most influential technologists of the 20th century by institutional investor and has been awarded for advancing the information society by the Finnish Ministry of Transport and Communications. Bo currently works as an independent advisor at Findy.fi, a senior advisor at the Finnish Council of Regulatory Impact Analysis, a founder and steering committee member at MyData.org, and with the publicly funded Real-Time Economy Program. Hello, Bo. Hello, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, Bo. Thanks for joining us. And definitely I want to hear uh, all these very interesting things about EI that's 2.0. So let's start, let's get started. Let's talk about digital identity. We'd like to hear from your very extensive and varied background in, in banking and technology. Please tell us a bit more about your career journey, how everything until today working in the Finnish EI 2.0 world groups. Yeah, it's a long ladder and I, I want to call it a ladder. Mm -hmm. It started back in the in the late 70s when we developed the first versions of home banking. It became PC banking in the very early 1980s for private customers at Union Bank of Finland, then nowadays Nordea, and also for SMEs long before internet. The first step was obviously with payments, invoice payments typically, bill payments. And then we moved on to, to put all banking services actually into e-banking before internet already. So that was the first phase. The second phase was about interconnecting bank customers, not only with payments, but also with e-identification, e-signatures, e-invoice and e-salary, for, for example. This was a very important step when you look at the benefits for society at large. You get the economy of, of trust, the economy of reuse, the economy of repetition, the economy of scale and all that. And from here, when internet then came in the mid 90s, we had already half a million people on e-banking in Finland. And we were the biggest e-banking in, in e-banking in the world in absolute terms for many, many years, all the way to Nordea. So from here, we established then a public-private real-time economy program, focusing very much on e-invoicing, counting automation, real-time income register for the tax authorities. And that's what I tried to, to also promote when I was the chairman for the EU Commission expert group. The next phase, if I condense this ladder, was the My Data principles that started to grow out in 2016, putting the citizen in control of all of his or her data, naturally supported by the legal promise from GDPR in Europe. But we could see at that early stage that there was no practical way of getting this data to travel from the enterprises that had a legal obligation to send it. And that's where we started to look for a new solution in 2017 and 18. And there we could see that self-sovereign identity and trust over IP was the solution to, to go forward with. 
And we, we established this uh, public-private uh, Findu cooperative as the solution. And it was a real eye-opener. And this is soon coming to aid us to see that we were able to solve the pressing need for being able to trade and issue non-listed, unlisted shares. And there you have this pretty tricky situation that you, you need to serve private shareholders, organizational shareholders, the issuer, the state, the trade registry, the banks for payments, for trading, for settlement, for delivery, for keeping up the registers. But when you issued all of these parties with the same, same generic wallets or fact wallets, we prefer to call them fact wallets, identity wallets is the other name for it, then it was astonishingly easy to interconnect these parties for coders four months and it worked like a dream. So that's when I got the eyes open for the EADAS architecture needs. So that's the that's a ladder. And actually the ladder is important to understand that you should have all the rungs or the steps on it, you know, enabled to rise to the higher platforms in between. That was the path, my path. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Well very of course being Long, long journey and super interesting all the type of projects you have been involved and, and now you are in working very heavily on EIDAS especially this new version 2.0 uh, if you can tell us about that but also tell us for, for the ones we are not so familiar what is, what is EIDAS and then tell us the difference between the, the current EIDAS 1.0 and the, and the new one EIDAS 2.0 Yes, EIDAS 1 and EIDAS 2 are two entirely different things. EIDAS 1 failed. It was focusing on uh, cross-border identification services with pretty stiff requirements. And there were two things missing that led to the failure, supply and demand. There is such a limited need for identifying citizens or organizations cross-border. And in the Nordic countries, we already have extremely well-functioning identification services in place, mainly run by the banks. In Finland, also teleoperators are involved. I think that may be the only country in the world where teleoperators are, are, are doing this as well. It's good with competition. But when you talk about EIDAS 2, it's not a question of identification. It's a question of identity. And that's a totally different thing. You could say that the identity is built from credentials from all sorts of sources in the private sector, in the public sector, statements uh, about your knowledge, your skills, your vaccinations, uh, your where you live, and with, with disclosing as little as possible thousands of different statements that build a person's identity all the way to, a, you might call it a digital twin. And, and here, obviously, ADAS2 is promising that every European will get a wallet issued by qualified issuers, possibly also by the states if needed. And these wallets are then the ones where you will get these credentials, the statements, the verified data about you when you need it. So that's a big difference between ADAS 1 and ADAS 2. And obviously ADAS 2 is, is an absolutely enormous opportunity for the economy at large on the one hand and for building a real single digital market on the other hand. As you had mentioned wallets, uh, earlier you mentioned fact wallets or identity wallets. Does it already exist just to understand that concept better? Can you describe how it would be in practice? Is there anything like that today that so we can have an idea? There are already wallets out there, pretty many, many versions of them actually. Obviously, Europe is working on trying to establish what kind of standards such a wallet should have, be it then uh, an application in your mobile phone, which seems to be very much in focus now, mainly serving uh, citizens, also perhaps smaller enterprises. But obviously, these kind of applications or wallets, ID wallets or rather fact wallets, are also needed by larger organizations. And then the mobile application is not the solution, but an application, a computer or, or in the cloud. But obviously all these wallets, be they then in a mobile or in a computer or in the cloud, 
should be interoperable by design. That's the whole mm-hmm. idea. Yeah. Understanding now the what is this new concept of EI 2.0 based on identities that you said in bullets. Tell us more about the opportunities that this new new framework is is, is going to provide for, for the future across Europe. Yes, I'm I'm very happy to to see that the commission work is is really embracing the self-sovereign identity, which is obviously a the standard and I can't see any alternative to that. And in many, many countries already trust over IP stacks are the starting point like they are here in Finland and have been already for, for five years. And and here what will happen is that the data rights holder, you as a citizen or you as a as a working for a company, you are in the driver's seat. You can go to a data source, public or private, and say that now I have a life event of this sort, looking for a job, establishing a company, somebody has has died in the near family, which is the most stressful life event, and thousands of other life events. And now I need data from, from all of these, all relevant sources. And I have a wallet, and the wallet is helping me to find those sources, and then I get the data to my wallet, and then I go to a service provider of my choice. I have this data, and you are specializing in, in this particular life event. If I need financing, it may be a bank. And could you please uh, take care of the, of the need? And the beauty of this is that these three parties, the data rights holder with the wallet, the source, and the service provider, do not need to be technically integrated. Do not need to be technically integrated. Because in this infrastructure, the technical connection is handled in the infrastructure, which is very cheap to build. Of course, it needs rule books. And that's that's the whole beauty of it. And obviously, this um, infrastructure, we call it the data highway here in Finland, is used both by the public sector and the private sector. That's a no pra- no-brainer. Like a road is open to everyone to use, and it should obviously be a non-profit uh, organization that handles this. That's why we have established this Find cooperative to do that. So that's how it works. And it's not that difficult to understand, actually. Uh, the benefits of self-sovereign identity are absolutely enormous. It's reducing risk and friction in the economy at large. It's, of course, improving automation. It's protecting privacy like nothing we have seen before. It's preventing crime and gray economy. And this book that I mentioned to you, Self Sovereign Identity by Drummond Reed, is quoting sources saying that the, that the cost of cybercrime is something in the region of six trillion dollars. So that's a kind of a big big picture. McKinsey, for its part, estimates the benefits of the trust infrastructure to be three to six percent of GDP, depending on the maturity of, of a country. So this is an absolutely massive step forward. Some people say that this is more important than internet. I agree. And some people say that the fact wallet is at least as important as the internet browser was when internet started. So so you can see that this is something that every state, every government should actually do everything they can. And obviously European Union to happen as fast as possible. We have no time to lose in this world. But they cannot do it on their own. And they are... The clever governments understand that they have to do this hand in hand with the self sovereign identity experts and the enterprises that are working in that field, and that's the way it works in Finland. Yeah, definitely. The way you the way you say it sounds like there are definitely plenty of benefits, and yeah, we hope to see these benefits in the near future, definitely. Well, I mean, it's it's a kind of a responsibility of of, of any government that are looking for for reducing crime and improving privacy and, and above all naturally getting the productivity in place and the benefits of, of, of data according to the my data principles. And this is the really only practical way I can see that we could implement the my data principles protecting people's data. 
I've seen during 40 years of, of digital work, I've seen a lot of important things, but this is the biggest by far. If you're going to go into the to the wallets, which will get a lot of so-called credentials or statements, uh, verified data, the e-receipt is something of the highest volume and even the lines in the e-receipts. If you look at the number of lines in e-receipts and e-invoices in Finland, and both of them will in a couple of years' time be the only kind accepted legally in, in accounting. There are some 20 billion of them every year. And these can each line can be verified on its own. So it will be by far the biggest volume of credentials sitting delivered from the seller's wallet to the buyer's wallet, be the buyer or seller, private or, or an organization. And, and the reuse of this e-receipt is a fantastic opportunity. We all know what travel expense uh, work means for, for all of us. We know how difficult it is to, to get financing in enterprises uh, when you have an invoice there verified by the buyer. It's so much easier. For insurance companies in, in Finland only, there is calculation saying that about 100 million can be saved when, when e-receipts are actually available. And, and obviously the insurance fraud is a, is a big issue in any country. That's just one example, but there are any number of them. That what, what is the, when you get a verified data statement, a credential, that can be used in so many different places. So the e-receipts is also part of the... Uh... EIDAS 2.0? Well, it's not directly, but I mean, when you have EIDAS 2.0 in the right way, and I'm a little bit worried, I have to admit about uh, the commission's, uh, let's say, level of understanding of the importance of this 3 to 6% of GDP. Uh, they are focusing, in my opinion, too much on the private wallets and not enough on the enterprise wallets to, to get the real benefit. If you, if you focus only on private wallets, and for example, then government issued credentials, then you get 0.0% of 0.1% perhaps of the benefits. But when you have a full picture, then you can get 90% of the enormous, enormous benefits. That's why I wrote this open letter, which can be found in, in my LinkedIn account also, uh, if somebody's interested to, to the commission, that we should understand how how big this step can be if it's done correctly and not only looking at some sort of additional identification tool and only government issued credentials. Yeah, we're going to add this. Uh, I, I read your open letter to the EU Commission, so yeah, we're going to add it also to the show notes of this episode so people can read it, definitely. How can we center the user's needs while at the same time balancing organizational priorities in any new solution? Yes, this is a very good question and an important question. And, and I don't have all of the answers here, but I have some basic answers based on my experience and uh, from banking and, and so forth. I think that the, the mission and the must always be the passion in any organization that wants to be successful is to, to think hard, hard about what the customers need tomorrow. It's, it's a familiar phrase is that you should never ask the customer what he needs because he doesn't know, you should know before he does. And in this particular time now, I think it's time to start all the service design from the customer's life events. What data is needed for this life event and where does it sit? How can the data be verified and available in real time? The value of data arriving one second faster is quite different from, from the one that comes later. And it's then in this particular setting, natural for many, many organizations to issue these wallets, be they in a mobile phone or in a computer, and also then uh, include uh, the national ID, invite the government to, to make the root ID, the electronic ID, ID card, uh, into these wallets so that it can be used for opening bank accounts and, and whatnot where, where this is always needed according to, to law, at least in the Nordics. But also other credentials from the public sector. Then you can produce 
a fantastic value for the customers, be they private customers or, or SMEs for argument's sake, and a national charge so that you cover costs and the costs are not big. That is the fantastic feature here with open source technology and, and open data and, and open standards. So I see that the solution will be that the role of a public and private sector organizations will be, and is already in GDPR, supply data, but it should be verified data. The value of verified data is, is a thousand times more than just generic data, also for machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. To supply that data to citizens and SME fact wallets, and these are generic tools generic tools, standardized interfaces all over the place. The data rights holder, as I said before here, then herself decides which service provider is best suited to, to use the data to solve the need. And then in an ideal world, the public sector would not need to act as a service provider at all. They can let the enterprises do that on their own and that would save a lot of taxpayers' money. But of course, we have to see to it that there are no uh, walled gardens built, that uh, data is flowing freely, that you can always ch change your service provider without any, any lock-ins, and that the competi competition is, is serving us all. It shouldn't be that difficult because the whole self-sovereign identity is built on, on open standards and and no world gardens and no technology, no it's, it's a kind of religion in that. So, so that's why I feel so comf comfortable in, in promoting it. Now with your, with your experience working in, in Finland in banking and, and several other projects until now, how, how can Europe, and even if we see it uh, globally, uh, with initiatives like, uh, like GAIN, the Global Assure Identity Network, how this can learn from the experiences in Finland and in the Nordics in general? Yeah, I have to admit that I have uh, failed miserably in, in one aspect. This e-identification services that GAIN is now looking at um, was started back in, I think, 93 in Finland. And, and we, have, we have then taken it from here to the other Nordic countries so that the banks are actually uh, the suppliers of e-identification services. And I have been preaching this in conferences all over the world all the time since then. And I have written any number of blogs in the Finextra blog posts. You can, you can find it on frequently that banks should be doing this and not only by their own will, but should actually be forced into this kind of service by the government because they are so suited, because they are trusted, trusted institutions and the economy of trust is in, in immensely important and they are legislated into it because of the anti-money laundering legislation and all that. And now GAIN is looking at it and unfortunately it is very late and now with the wallets you don't need it in the same time, as in the same way as you would have done it if you had started 20 years ago, as 25 years ago as, as we did. But I didn't get it my way. There's been so many different crises in banking that has taken away the attention. A little bit the same has happened also in electronic invoicing. Banks woke up a little bit late. I can only look myself in the, in the mirror. But um, the lessons learned in Finland was that the economy of reuse and the economy of trust, using bank ID for identifying in all kinds of services was really, really important. It, it became a generic tool both in your private role and in your work roles. And now when you have this in overflow of everything, I mean, the attention span is, if it is eight seconds still, it's good. I mean, the goldfish has nine seconds and, and everything else is, is, is overflowing except time. And the value of something that you know already and trust is growing exponentially. But now I jump from there to the wallets. A generic wallet that you can use at home and at work, supported by a generic public-private joint infrastructure is, of course, even more valuable, many times more 
valuable than the e-identification services provided by the banks. And this is something that not only the banking sector should be providing, but many other sectors as well, and everyone should should naturally use it. So we have to live with the times and realize that people don't have time to, to learn anything new if it can be avoided. Uh, now seeing at the at the evolution, because uh, EIDAS 2.0, as I understand, is still in being cooked, let's say, so it's not completely finished. So how, let's say, smaller EU countries and even individuals who are really concerned about this, what's going to, how, how it's going to be this standard and the standards coming, can have more, more power to influence the commission decisions that is going to affect so many residents? And this is a very critical question, an important question. And, and to get anything done now, the first thing to say is that even if you have the best public servants in the world, they are not self sovereign identity experts. Even if the European Commission has said that the self sovereign identity is, is at, at the core of ADAS, they haven't yet understood, have had time to understand the full picture, perhaps. The remedy is that uh, you in any country sit down with the public sector and say that, okay, you government, you have realized that you can have three to six percent GDP benefits out of this trust infrastructure. And you do understand that your lawyers and economists and whatnot, they are not experts in, in building this radically new infrastructure. You have to do it together in this public-private team, formulate the narrative, and some basic use cases like the receipts or whatnot, so that the citizens will actually start asking for it, demanding it from, from their own government. That's what you need. And from Brussels, because we do understand that Europe is the biggest economy in the world. And, and if it becomes one single market, the benefit for everyone will be absolutely massive. And this is a real This trust infrastructure is a bigger step than internet and the fact well, that this is the new browser. So, so we have to, to get people to understand how big this is. And then the countries, once you've done it in your home country, then you join forces with others like we now do with Sweden, Norway and Germany, Holland and so forth and influence Brussels so that it is not over-regulated and which make it, will make it too expensive for small players and actually just help large organizations to, to protect their positions. They have money enough to, to do this, even if it's very regulated. So it's important to see to it that the competition from the smaller guys is possible. So, yeah, it's important to, as you said, join forces, right, with countries that are already, countries and organizations that are already active and yeah, quite knowledgeable and active today. Exactly, and that's what we are doing now. Very happy to see that our neighbor Sweden has been quite keen to, to work together with, with other countries also. And when is expected to be ready EIDAS 2.0? Well, it had a very tight timetable when it was launched. We were, of course, quite happy about that last summer. It was announced and this was exactly what we had been hoping for and even more. So that was good. But then um, it has now taken a lot of time and, and gone into over-regulation aspects, uh, which we fear, and uh, not enough understanding for the need for organizational wallets and, and of course, also wallets for things and, and pets and, and whatnot to get the full benefit. So I'm, let's say, prepared to, to wait half a year more if these aspects uh, get into the drawings so that you can get the benefits out of it, uh, the economic benefits and privacy benefits and single market benefits. So we must work hard to, to avoid, let's say, minimal mobile application for, for citizens only. I, I don't know how long it will take, but probably not much will be seen out in way of use cases uh, this year. Next year should be a breakthrough year. Okay, in 2023, we'll see some of the fruits at least will be available for people to use in, as you say, organizations as well, all together. Absolutely. Excellent. Final question for you, Bo. For all business leaders listening to us now, what is the one actionable idea that they should write on their agendas today? Well, this is, of course, a very challenging question. But if I choose from a long list of experiences, uh, 
from the past in electronic banking, electronic invoicing, e-identification services and and all and how they come together and, and form the ladder. And when this ladder was, uh, when we started to raise this ladder, we were happy enough to have hundreds and hundreds of bank branches that could do the selling to the, on a personal basis to the, to the individuals. Now there are not really that many bank, bank branches left anymore. So it's a, it's a new, it's a new game. You have to do it without much personal selling. So my simple line would be to say that for God's sake, (laughs) do not serve your customer. So her life event with the fact wallets for all needed verified data into the wallets. And you have to do it closely together with the public sector. And they should also help with the financing because so much of the benefits will be for the society at large and only a small part for the for the enterprises uh, as such but um, this is the joint effort the biggest one i've seen ever well thank you very much Bob, for this very interesting conversation and shedding a light about ei 2.0 and everything that is yeah behind that and i, I can definitely learn a lot from this conversation. I'm sure a lot is such fun and also super interesting. If someone would like to hear more about you or get in touch with you or follow you, what are the best ways? Well, I have such an unusual name, so it's easy to find me on LinkedIn and please feel free to, to contact me. I have written blogs for at least 10 years on Finextra. So there, most of the material that uh, I have myself produced can be found there in in fairly condensed form, not too, too long text. So please feel free to, to use as much as you like. Okay, perfect. Again, thanks a lot, both for this conversation and all the best. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk About Digital Identity, produced by UbiSecure. Stay up to date with episode at ubisecure.com slash podcast or join us on Twitter at ubisecure and use the hashtag LTADI. Until next time, 